Hi everyone, it's Tina Ramirez, and I'm very excited to be here today with my friend, Dr. Elizabeth Pedromo. Uh, Dr. Pedromo is a professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, and that's where she actually directs the initiative on religion, law, and diplomacy. And I know she's gonna tell us a little bit about that, but let me just say that I first met Dr. Pedromo uh, many years ago, actually the year that I first went to Washington, so I think it was like 2004, uh, when she first became a commissioner at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And so it was, um, gosh, that's been almost like 18 years, I think. I don't, am I counting correctly? But it, it's been a long time, and I have just had such a great uh, experience learning from her, growing from her, working with her on so many different areas and projects. And so Thank you, Elizabeth, for being with us today. Thank you, Tina. It's great to be with you. And yes, I think you're right. Um, <laughs> I'm not very I'm not very good at math, but 17 <laughs> plus years ago, I think that's the duration of how long we've known each other. And it's really been a privilege and an honor to to be working with you first on the USERF and now with Hardwired. And how I wanted to say from the outset how happy I am and uh, committed I am to being part of uh, the mission and the work of Hardwired. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, so let's just jump right in. One of the things that I love uh, about your passion for religious freedom is just your personal interest in your story. I mean, the first day I met you, I, I think I went to pick you up at Union Station and we had to trudge our way with bags and all over to the USERF building, you know, through the streets in, of DC. And so um, it's it just, I, I developed just such an appreciation for you at that moment and would love for you to share with everybody what makes this work something that you have given your life and your passion to? Uh, I think you you, want, you asked me a little bit about my own origin story. Yeah. And um, I, I think like most people who work in the field of human rights and who work on religious freedom, freedom of conscience and belief, uh, we have our own personal experiences with that. And in my case, um, I, I grew up in a family, I'm Greek Orthodox Christian. I grew up in a family uh, that had had its own experiences with um, violations of religious freedom, persecution, institutionalized discrimination. Um, but more than that, beyond the personal experience, grew up in a tradition that taught that every person is created in the image of God. So the image of a divine, divine being, um, and that every person is created in the image of God and with human dignity and especially with, with in, in freedom. And so the centrality of freedom to being human and the centrality of freedom to realizing and protecting and allowing for human dignity is something that my own tradition taught me. And you know, with that, those teachings and then the personal experience of our, our family and our long family history, um, I understood the, the, that it was my responsibility in whatever professional space that I chose or pathway I chose to commit to recognizing that every person is created in that image and to do whatever I can to support and protect and sustain human dignity, whether at the individual level or, or the group level. So I sort of internalized those messages as a child and then I grew to understand them and commit to them um, throughout the rest of my life. Well, and that's led you to do so much work for the Greek Orthodox Church. And so we've gotten to collaborate on a number of things. You know, when I was at the commission, then I went to the Hill and I worked for a, a Greek congressman and I helped him in with the Hellenic Caucus writing some legislation that you were very involved in and you were still at the commission at the time. And uh, we'll talk about the legislation in a minute, but that was really the outgrowth of, I had gone on a trip for the congressman to Syria and I had seen what was happening to the Syriac church there. And then we went into Turkey and we were seeing what happened to the Greek church all over, over Turkey and to the Syriac church as well. And, and just a lot of the lawsuits and cases they were working with. You arranged a meeting for us with, with the patriarch. So I got to meet him. And so, but coming back from that, you and I worked together on some legislation to help uh, the, the um, Greek church in the northern occupied area of, of Cyprus. Can you share a little bit about that and what, what we did? And I, I'll add to it, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Sure, on sure, sure. And I, and I appreciate your sharing, you know, the background about your trip to the region, your trip to Syria, because I think it also reminds everyone that, you know, in terms of the, what we think about as the Middle East, I mean, that, that is the space 
with the origins of Christianity. It's the, the wellspring of the three Abrahamic traditions. Um, and although I think, you know, there's certainly at the popular level, but also at the policy level, there's a recognition that Judaism and Islam are part of the Middle East. Oftentimes, we tend to forget or people tend to forget that this is the wellspring of Christianity as well. So for the, the four uh, patriarchates in Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria, along with the fifth patriarchate in terms of the early church, Rome, um, four of those five are in a space um, that unfortunately is defined by systematic violations of religious freedom and state failures and, and violence. So your trip there, I think your trip to Syria was a reminder of that. And then the legislation that you mentioned, uh, that was legislation that was passed by the Congress and that um, required or mandated that the US Commission on International Religious Freedom on our trip uh, in, at that time impending trip to Turkey also traveled to Turkish occupied Cyprus. And, we're coming up on 50 years of the Turkish occupation of uh, the northern part of Cyprus. And Turkey is the Turkish military, is uh, according to international law, the so-called competent authority, therefore responsible for what happens in the northern occupied section of the island. And so when the US Commission on International Religious Freedom traveled to Turkey, we did travel as well to occupied Cyprus. And, you know, alas, that is a space in which, um, you know, we saw some of the most systematic and comprehensive forms of religious cleansing, um, ethnic cleansing as well, but religious cleansing, um, everything from the destruction of religious and cultural sites to the expulsion of um, the Christian populations, uh, Greek, um, Armenian, Maronite, um, and a space in which the remaining Muslim population also lives um, in an authoritarian way uh, without full religious freedom. So that legislation was instrumental. I think, unfortunately, as a harbinger of things to come, I think in, in pointing out what happens with invasion and occupation. And we see that uh, in the case of Northern Syria now with Turkey's occupation there and other parts of the region. But it's not only Turkey, it's a, it's a, it's a global phenomenon, but you were instrumental in that legislation in ensuring that the commission traveled to both spaces. Well, it was so critical because the commission hadn't been able to visit Northern Cyprus before that. Uh, it was really just something that Turkey would never talk about. I mean, they don't wanna talk about most of these human rights abuses that they're involved in, but, but for the US government it was critical and it was a bipartisan effort. The Hellenic yes, Caucus yes. Was, was Republican and Democrat. And so we were able to, to show that uh, this is really a bipartisan um, effort to support the truth in what's happening. And I mean, we need to do justice to this. Literally mosaics were taken off entire walls and churches. Churches were turned into uh, bars and brothels and everything else for other purposes by the Turkish military. And then they were literally sold illegally in the black market and they found these items like in Houston, Texas and other parts of the world where, where people were, were selling artwork that had been stolen from these Greek churches that had literally just been, I mean, taken it. And it was done across all of Northern Cyprus so that all of the Greek history and population and just culture was totally dis dismantled and destroyed. So this was the first time that we were able to actually pass legislation that said, this is a violation of international law, of humanitarian law. You do not do this. And Turkey needed to be held accountable for that. So I was excited to be a part of that effort. And I think it was one of the, you know, it's one of, it's important to point out because rarely do we have a bipartisan success like that and something where we can point to, we passed legislation and it led to something specific. The commission actually had to travel there, was able to travel there, and you were able to issue a report on that. So I'm so glad that you were able to do that. Tina, I think you point out also so many important elements of how international religious freedom works or doesn't work or efforts to protect it work or don't work. And in this case, you emphasize um, the importance of legislation, 
uh, the importance of bipartisanship in terms of the United States and its foreign policy commitments to our uh, international religious freedom. The fact that religious freedom is not a partisan issue, it's a human rights issue, it's a universal human rights issue, and it should be something that is supported on both sides of the aisle. And I think, in, in fact, it has been. Um, and that's that's very, very, it's important to point it out and it's important to say, sustain that bipartisan commitment. You also mentioned the, um, the black marketing of uh, religious artifacts, mosaics and other religious artifacts. And I think you highlight in the case of Turkish occupied Cyprus, something that, you know, hardwired has seen and been exposed to in Iraq, for example, the way in which cultural heritage whether it's artwork, whether it's other forms of artifacts, whether it's iconography or mosaics, um, the way in which um, religious violence, religious persecution or discrimination um, is expressed in, in spaces that we don't necessarily think about. And the black marketing of those kinds of artifacts, the destruction of cultural and religious heritage um, leads oftentimes to the destruction of any sustainable communities, but it also erases any physical evidence that those communities once exist. So, you know, we've used this term before, it's a form of memoricide because it erases the memory of existing communities. So that trip, I think, really reinforced, again, what we see in other parts of the world that, you know, when we see uh, sacred sites, we shouldn't think of them simply as objects, inanimate objects. Those are the spaces that give expression to religious communities. Those are the spaces that allow for durable, sustainable living communities. And they're also the evidence and the memory of those communities' long historical presence. And that's relevant globally, but unfortunately Turkish occupied Cyprus is a, and I say unfortunately, because it's so tragic, is a perfect example of this broader phenomenon. Well, I think you just explained it brilliantly. And I mean, it just reminds me of Afghanistan. When the Taliban came in, they destroyed all the, the Buddhist history and, and culture and the memory of it is completed. But that was like thousands and thousands of years of history, not just, I mean, and it's just washed away. I, when I was on the Hill, I was also working on Sudan and trying to, at the time, preserve the, um, to make UNESCO, to make a World Heritage Site of the pyramids that were in the Meroe area where they ended up flooding a majority of them when they built the Meroe Dam which is horrifying. They protected a small portion of them, but I mean, these are, these were historic pyramids that they had more pyramids down there than they have in Egypt. So, you know, it's the destruction of religious and cultural artifacts of historical things is tragic at so many levels. Uh, we see it, we saw it in Iraq with the war. I saw it in Syria. So when I was visiting there, I saw all of the sites that the government was actually preserving of the Syriac church everyone that hates the Syrian government, this is something they were doing that was very positive. And they were literally restoring all the Syriac churches. And now those have been destroyed again. So, um, and artifacts, you know, stolen from Syria. And then in Northern Iraq, we saw that time and again with ISIS, with the destruction of, of Christian and Yazidi churches and temples across the North. So, um, Anyway, let's, I want to switch and talk about Iraq a little bit and then about your work on democracy, because that's really the core of your teaching. And, that, and you can maybe share a little bit as well, just as you begin with why that's so, why the religious dimension of it is so important to your work at Tufts. So, at, and at the Fletcher School. So, uh, as you know, being, since you're on our advisory board, Hardwired has worked in Iraq for a number of years. And our focus in the beginning was really civil society education so that we could train up leaders that could defend freedom of religion and belief broadly for everybody, not just for their own community, which I believe that we've, we've accomplished. These communities are working together and really working together towards one another's freedom in a unique and really powerful way that I think is a great model for so many countries. But we've, we've moved in recent years towards education and, and training children that were really radicalized and, and taught under ISIS to be you know, terrorists and to hate and kill people that were different to value the religious other, the, the, the ethnic other. And in doing so, we found that that work has had just exponential positive benefits to helping build resiliency against extremism, helping um, really increase respect for the rights of girls and women in society uh, that were extremely adversely affected by the situation with ISIS and the, the um, violence against the Yazidi girls. 
And then many other positive conflicts from reducing conflict in the area to just overall the reducing, reducing the effects of trauma on children, et cetera. So your work within democracy at Tufts, religion and democracy, can you talk a little bit about what you do there? And then I would love to hear more specifically, what are the lessons you've learned in this work in maybe Syria, Turkey, and some other countries that you've, you've focused on in your work there? Well, I'd be glad to. First of all, thank you for asking about the work at the Fletcher School um, at Tufts. I am a fa the faculty director for the Initiative on Religion, Law, and Diplomacy. Um, and that's an initiative that allows students, faculty, and more generally, the Fletcher community to learn about, think about, and engage with religion as part of international relations. And the Fletcher School has been a very hospitable place uh, for uh, for doing just that. Uh, and their students of the Fletcher School end up in leadership positions in government, in the private sector, in nonprofit NGOs, um, in education, um, and in human rights work, in the private sector as well. And one of the, I think, really exciting things about the initiative is that by integrating religion along with economics, along with law, along with politics into the um, into the curricular offerings of the school, students begin to think about the intersectionality of religion in general, but in more specifically freedom of conscience, belief and religion when it comes to critical questions of sustainable development, uh, democratization, and building durable peace in uh, post-conflict situations or significantly in preventing um, episodic violence from degenerating into full-on uh, war and state collapse. So, the, so flat, that's what we're doing in terms of the initiative on religion, law, and diplomacy. Uh, and I think you know this leads us then to the work of Hardwired and the origin story of Hardwired, and then the work on the ground in Iraq. And that's the centrality of education um, in creating the possibilities for doing something. And this is where we started. We're doing something so crucial as um, supporting and protecting human dignity for protecting freedom, freedom of conscience, literally what we believe, and then freedom of practice, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, um, the uh, right to own property, private property and collective property. All of these things are tied to or intersectional with a freedom of religion. And so thinking about those connections how do we learn about them? We learn about them through our socialization processes, but also we're taught them. And that's why educational curricula, curriculum design, teacher training, and the content of curriculum is so crucial. And the work of Hardwired, for example, doing this at a young age, you know, we can use the K through 12 analogy in the US, but starting at a young age allows, first of all, teachers to think responsibly about what it is they're communicating. It allows for you know, children and students to share a space where they're being socialized together across communal lines, across sectarian lines, or between believers and non-believers. And to recognize that in that educational space, everyone is equal and by extension, everyone is and should or should be equal before the law. So the ed public education and teachers have such an enormous impact and responsibility on how we think about the other, how we see our neighbor, um, how we respect and protect them as human beings. And so I think, and, and also the intergenerational transmission of those messages. Education is the space where that intergenerationality begins because to use the title of one of Hardwire's programs by planting seeds in, in, in a garden of peace, you're starting at a young age to teach, to internalize, to socialize, and therefore to produce practices that will be passed on cross-generationally. And Elizabeth, because you, I mean, you see and you've traveled to so many of those countries in the Middle East region, why, why is, I mean, it's, why is education so important to addressing some of those longer term sustainable needs in a society? Because you've seen it firsthand. So, yeah, and I and I don't. I, I mean, I think the Middle East is a sort of, you know, a, a, a representation of again global a, a global issue, and that is the critical importance of access to education for all, um, and that not only should everyone have access, 
but what we learn, what we teach and what we learn in, uh, you know, in public education shapes societies, it shapes mindsets, it shapes attitudes, and therefore um, it's directly related to practices. And, and so that's, again, I think something that's so important about the work of Hardwired, which is, you know, teaching about legal protections, but also um, recognizing the importance of education in shaping norms, values, attitudes, and behaviors. And so whether we're talking about, you know, the Middle East or the United States or South Asia or, you know, or Africa or Europe, the, the centrality of education as an enormous socialization experience that again tells us who is our neighbor, who's a fellow citizen, and how do we think about the rights of those fellow citizens or do we not? Education is, is, is so critical and I think we oftentimes underappreciate that. If we think about you know, post peace building environments or peace building efforts, oftentimes education is left off of the agenda. And leaving education off of the agenda fails to recognize then the significance for freedom of conscience, freedom of religion and belief, and all these other associated foundational freedoms that either build democracy or support autocracies and authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Well, that leads me to the next question, which is, you know, in the Middle East generally, um, it seems that they're more predisposed to authoritarian regimes rather than dem democratic ones. Why do you think that that is? Well, so I teach a lot on the Middle East and I teach a lot on Southeastern Europe. So kind of the Eastern Medi Mediterranean space. And I think, you know, certainly we see in, in the Middle East, um, you know, the unfortunate durability of authoritarian regimes. But I think it's also important to recognize that we're talking about states that are relatively young. Um, almost all of the states in the region are, you know, barely a century, and most of them are less than a century old because we're talking about states that are post-colonial, post-imperial, and post-colonial. So they're relatively young states. Um, that's one thing. So our, our expectations about a functionality, uh, I think, have to be placed within that that context. And then I think um, the unfortunate durability of authoritarianism is due to both you know, local circumstances and then the geopolitical importance of the region where um, you know, the region itself is, states in the region are oftentimes subjected to invasion, to um, occupation or to violence that is not only related to indigenous conditions but um, connected to external conditions. And unfortunately the 2003 US invasion of Iraq I think is a, 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 an example of that because uh, you know, that, that, um, that invasion led to the kind of state collapse, yes, regime transformation, yes, ending, you know, the horrible authoritarianism of the Saddam Hussein regime, but not producing uh, a different kind of outcome, a non-authoritarian outcome. And, and in that particular case, and I think you've seen it through the work of Hardwired on the ground, um, the institutional weaknesses the weakness of the judicial system, the weakness of uh, security structures, um, the you know the impoverishment of, of education, and also the enormous and sustained economic um, travails of of the country help to you know explain why it is that uh, what almost twenty years later since two thousand three uh, we don't see a robust, stable, vibrant democracy, but we do see people's incredible willingness to sustain, you know, to endure in the face of the worst kinds of privations of freedom of conscience, belief and religion. And I think there, insofar as we do see those, those elements of hope and commitment, again, the work of Hardwired uh, uh, with education, training and centering freedom of conscience, belief and religion as part of the broader basket of freedoms that people care so deeply about or are willing to sacrifice their lives for is, uh, you know, it moves us beyond theory. It shows how at the most uh, granular level, at the grassroots level, freedom of conscience, belief and religion is understood by, by everyone on the ground to be related to all these other fundamental freedoms that can build slowly, slowly, you know, imperfectly, 
and this is again a global phenomenon democracy out of non democratic regimes. Well, I can imagine how fascinating your your course is because you're able to pull from so many different countries and experiences to talk about how democracy works the relationship between law and religion. And I mean, we've seen it firsthand in Iraq for the last 20 years, but like you said, I mean, we spent over $2 trillion. We have no pathway to victory. And I keep thinking, you know, if you want to plant a tree today, you plant the seed, I mean, or tomorrow you, you plant the seed today. Like, you you know, if you want a tree tomorrow, you got to plant it today. Like you need to prepare ahead. And I think, gosh, if 20 years, if we had just worked on in infusing in the culture, um, letting them have conversations of critical thinking of, of, of developing their own cultural understanding of what are our rights? Where do we see them? What do we want? That conversation was never had at a very grassroots level. And for 20 years, it's been, you know, up here, but by people really competing for power and it, and, and it needs to be happening at the base level in society in order for generations to grow that are able to contribute to that conversation. So it's a broader conversation. And that's what we see in Northern Iraq with what we're doing now is, you know, we're planting seeds and these children will become adults and they'll become voters and they'll engage in the democratic process in their country. But if we never really train and equip them to do that, to think differently, to challenge intolerance and, and, and fear of one another and the tribalistic kind of society they live in, then how are they ever going to have hope for their future? Tina, yeah, and Tina, in terms of the seed planting, you know, again, we're thinking past, present, and future. One of the things I think about Northern Iraq that's so important is, and you ask about the region more generally, is the importance of knowing history, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not sort of being gripped by the limitations of short-termism. You know, and policymaking is oftentimes based on sort of short-term objectives, but history is something that you know, is passed on again intergenerationally. It's told through stories, uh, it's lived through experience cross-generationally, and it's also learned in, in education. And, and what the Northern Iraq space shows us is that this is a history, a historical space of religious and cultural pluralism. And so the engagement, first of all, recognizing that pluralism and not kind of narrating the region as a space that is religiously homogenous. It may be homogeneous now, but that homogenization process has come through both violent and nonviolent mechanisms that have been dedicated to erasing that rich history of pluralism. So the work that you do by engaging and including emphasizes pluralism. It allows people to, um, their, their histories to be acknowledged and new institutional structures and new legal structures, new legislation to be written that recognizes pluralism rather than focusing on uh, homogenization or becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy by creating the conditions that lead to homogenization. And going back to what we talked about with cultural heritage, um, you know, I, I do a lot of work on Turkey. That's a, a, an example of where cultural heritage policy has been designed to disenfranchise and marginalize and appropriate the cultural heritage of Greek Orthodox Christians, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, Armenian Orthodox Christians, Apostolic Christians, uh, Syriac Orthodox Christians, and so many of the other Christian communities and the Jewish community in Turkey. So we see Turkey is an example of where we don't see widespread violence since the f f foundation of the Republic on genocide. We don't see um, you know, continuing widespread violence, although in the Southeast vis-a-vis -vis the primarily Kurdish population we do, but we, even in the absence of violence, we see the way that cultural heritage legislation, for example, um, leads to, through discrimination and through, under the guise of law, homogenization. And I think that's the case, you know, we know that's the case in other countries in the region, but in other parts of, of the world. So again, this emphasis on pluralism, I think, is so crucial in thinking about building durable, inclusive, democratic societies where people's dignity is acknowledged by acknowledging their history and their rights are protected by building the kind of structures and laws that are committed to doing so. Oh, I completely agree. And I'm, I, I just think all of your work is amazing and that it, it I, it's, yeah, it's remarkable. 
there are so many more countries we could talk about, but I would like to just ask you, since you're a professor here in the United States, most people don't understand university students. So <laughs> this, is, this is who you work with. You work with graduate students and you're preparing them to enter the world of, of diplomacy and diplomacy, you know, understanding religion within diplomacy. And so I want you to explain a little bit about that, but also, you know, how has your... Um, what's happening in the world, you know, with geopolitics affected, um, if you looked at what's happening in the United States here, how can you compare it to what's happening in the United States here, these conversations on, on freedom of conscience and religion around the world, how are, how are you seeing uh, these, some kind of like worrying trends here in America, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. Okay, um, well, well, thinking about, um, you know, being an academic, uh, you know, as an academic, you know, we do research and, uh, you know, publications, but from my perspective, the core of being an academic is teaching. And I, I think of teaching as service. Um, uh, I truly believe that teaching is a form of service. And so I think in terms of, you know, teaching graduate students who have come out of, in most cases, have already come out of a professional environment, they're coming to grad school, then they're going to go back into a professional environment. It's important to think in global and comparative terms. And if I think of the work of, of you know, the USERF on religious freedom or the work of Hardwired, one of the things that's striking is uh, and the, the, the regional focus that I have, one of the things that's striking and concerning, I think, is that signs of um, state fragility and state weakness and signs of social fragmentation and disintegration that, you know, are so visible in places like the Middle East or parts of Africa. Think about, you know, North and South Sudan. Think about Nigeria. Think about, um, think about Mali. Think about, um, I, I, we could go on and on. Or think about Afghanistan. Uh, think, think about um, Myanmar. Alas, so many examples. China, Turkey. We see signs of those um, weaknesses in the United States. And what do I mean by that? I, I think that, you know, we see signs of, um, first of all, the collapse of a civil discourse that allows people of different beliefs, uh, you know, different political perspectives to participate in, you know, conversations about existential issues, but that will affect us presently and in the, in the future. So the lack of, or the corrosion of a civil discourse or a discourse based on civility. Um, and we see that in other places where we've seen sectarian violence and intercommunal violence emerge, uh, where I, people are viewed on the basis of their identities rather than uh, as fellow citizens equal before the law. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work on the Balkans, the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, where we saw the collapse of the Yugoslav state um, with the emergence of, uh, uh, with the intersection of economic uh, differences and identity differences, and the intersection of economic pressures with um, identity politics, alas, again, I think is something that we're seeing in the United States. And we have an example like Yugoslavia to see where that ended up. Yugoslavia is not the only case, but it's a recent one and I think instructive. The other piece of this is the significance of a free and independent media. We see in cases around the world where of authoritarian regimes where the media no longer fulfills or never fulfilled its role as the fourth estate, as an independent you know, source of information, but also a, a kind of critic. Um, and I think, again, we need to think about that in the US and the, in the way that identity politics and religious politics inform um, the media. So these are things we're used to seeing in other parts of the world, but I think, you know, the signs are there that some of those, um, you know, some of those features are present in American politics and society. So we need to take lessons on freedom of conscience, belief in religion that we've, you know, seen in other, uh, other regions and begin to train them on the U.S. and think about, you know, what are the pathways and what are the trajectories and they're, they're all pretty negative if we don't stop and begin to make critical corrections. And those are corrections that require political maturity and they also require citizen responsibility. So yes, our elected officials have a responsibility 
and also citizens, we all have a responsibility towards one another to work according to what we've been talking about, commitments to freedom of conscience, belief, freedom of religion, freedom to change one's religion, to have no religion, and ultimately then to have equality before the law and a judiciary that protects that. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think we're seeing this, the fact that we're seeing it here is, is really indicative going back to something we talked about earlier of the lack of education of these values in our own society. So you can never take them for granted. We need to constantly re, you know, be at, as part of our education, reminding people why freedom of conscience and diversity of thought and this marketplace of ideas is so critical. The lessons of history, because in other countries, this is what happens. We've, we've seen the, the worst case scenario of what happens when people don't have these freedoms. So, you know, before we end, one of the things that I love is that you, uh, we, I think we've hired two staff from, from that have, that have studied under you. So that's how great of a professor you are. We love, we love working with you and, and getting your students. You. Clearly you are teaching them how to embody these values. But I mean, most people don't know that the co-founder of Hardwired was Sarah, uh, Schlesinger at the time, Sarah Pollock, who was one of your students up at Boston College. And, um, and she was just, I mean, such an amazing, just a friend and, and person to start the organization with. And I mean, just inspired our vision. And then we had another, um, a young man help us on the Hill with some of our work up there with, uh, with, you know, congressional work on freedom of religion. So Elizabeth, you are an inspiration to everybody. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to work with you over the years and that I can share a little bit, a little glimpse of all the great things that you do and your perspective. But I know that there's so many more things we can talk about. Is there anything else just in closing that you would like to share? Uh, no, I just want to thank you, Tina. I want to thank you for your vision and your dedication. Um, you are the origin of Hardwired. And um, I, I want to thank you for your inspiration. Um, and I also want to thank you again for recognizing the importance of education and education as a way to become a fuller human being. Um, you know, that letter of the law, spirit of the law. Okay, there are textbooks, there are what we do in terms of our formal education, but your commitment and your demonstration through the leadership of Hardwired that education is a way to become a fuller person and also it protects it allows for the protection of freedom, conscience, belief, and religion that is intrinsic to our humanity, to being literally ontologically a full person as individuals, but connected to community, regardless of the faith community, the community of belief or non-belief you, you belong to or you identify with, education is a way to allow that fullness and protect that fullness. So thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be on the advisory board of Hardwired. And thanks for mentioning, um, you know, uh, Sarah Schlesinger um, and, um, you know, the, the long history now of teaching. I guess I'm old enough <laughs> to have, you know, students who are like succeeding me. And that's exactly right. It's the seed planting. And I'm, I'm humbled to be a, a seed planter. You, you have been. And I mean, it's remarkable. Look at all the, the great work. I mean, I can't take full credit for hardware because really, you know, I mean, Sarah was a great partner to start with and, you know, she, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you were contributed, contributed to that and to helping us along the way. And I just, I hope people can understand that this is all a team effort, that it's not about one of us, but it's really how each of us do our part to help one another and help people really live with greater dignity and respect, regardless of what they believe or who they are, or, you know, their background. I, and that's, that's our, all of our mission for the world. So. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Tina. Thank you. And you're right. It, we're all part of it. We all have a responsibility towards one another when it comes to freedom of conscience, belief or religion, and all universal human rights. So we're all, um, we all have agency, um, and we all have responsibility. And indifference is a form of complicity um, in lack of respect for other human beings. So we need to, uh, we need to embrace our agency and do the best we possibly can. I think that's a great place to end. That was beautiful.